Welcome to the Gals Guide to the Galaxy podcast, where a group of gals gather for you one cool thing around our topic of the month. Is it ancient history? Is it breaking news? Is it safe for work? Well, that's up to each gal. All we know is that... Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Welcome back, y'all. Um, I'm Pamela, and I'm here with Bonnie, Leia, and Katie. We're talking about one cool rebel girl, gal each. Um, Bonnie's already told us the story of a Chinese rebel named Chao Jing. But before we dive back in, and I introduce you to another rebel gal, let's get acquainted with a random question. So ladies, can you rebel and conform at the same time? It's kind of like, can you walk and chew gum at the same time, isn't it? That I can't. <laughs> that's a different question. <laughs> oh, yes. Right, that's a hard no. Got it. <laughs> dun, dun. I, I can see Bonnie and Katie's thinking face. Yeah. I have thought about this one. I really did. I, I think you can, but I think I can't. <laughs> I think that other people can rebel and conform at the same time where they keep their rebellion kind of like within the populace, you know, like what, what is a comfortable rebellion? What is everybody, not too many of their, their peers will kind of like look at them strange. I don't have that ability though. If I'm rebelling, I'm going full fort rebellion and I kind of don't care. <laughs> and I know it's to my detriment a couple of times. <laughs> So, but yeah, that's, that's my theory. What do you ladies think? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just, okay. Like, with, right. um, like with the last year with all the protests and the Women's March, like, I don't know if it's so much rebellion, but it's speaking out. Yeah. And, but most of them are completely peaceful and they still, like, they have to get permits and all this stuff, but they're still... Okay. Going kind of conforming to the social norms, the social law, that sort of thing. Yeah, but they're still making a bit of a ruckus, <laughs> but they're doing it in an orderly fashion. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, those ladies with banners. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, you were going to say? Um, as I did a little research on rebels for prepping for this, mm -hmm. um, there's just, it's all women are rebels in their own way and there's so much diversity and I think that maybe if there are aspects of society that serve you and you want to conform that that's part of who you are then do it while you like lead your own rebellion does that make any sense gotcha some parts like, you're like this part's cool I'll keep it <laughs> right this part like, I'm gonna burn it down <laughs> you know this part of society makes sense to me we should you know respect our neighbors but you know but as I soon as they have a I'm side not... no i'm just kidding <laughs> well you know i had my own drama of that this election year i respect my neighbors but then they put the trump sign in the yard and i'm like he's not there anymore it's gonna be a ruckus at the old time tonight <laughs> yeah uh, still has it up no, oh really no. oh There's, i've seen two signs still up and one of them is my neighbor <laughs> I did see I my neighbors uh, down the street. One of them had, you know, just your regular standard size uh, Biden sign. And then uh, and then the next neighbor had a regular size, pretty much equal size Trump sign. Then I go by the next day and suddenly the Trump sign is four times bigger <laughs> and pointed directly at the Biden sign. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, right. this is going to be fun. And then the Biden sign got bigger and then the Trump sign got <laughs> And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> And do those signs actually change anyone's mind? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but those two were having fun. <laughs> I mean, not fun. They didn't think it was fun. I thought it was fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pamela, what about you? Do you think you can rebel and conform at the same time? Now, this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the years. Nice. And I not only think you can, but that if you do that, your rebellion becomes more powerful. Oh, um, gotcha. You know, Gustave Flaubert said, be regular and orderly in your life so you may be violent and original in your work. Oh, 
Oh, there you and go. I That's kind of like that what Bonnie was just saying. Yeah. Prove to apply to your writing or to visual arts, but also to acts of rebellion. I mean, otherwise you're like that Marlon Brando character that when they ask him, so what are you rebelling against? And he says, oh, what do you got? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you rebel against everything, you don't make an impact. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I think you not only can, but maybe you need to. Right. Good point. <laughs> Fascinating. And does that tie into your one rebellious gal? Hmm. Maybe. 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 It doesn't well, have to. <laughs> it doesn't have to, thank God. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, I really had a hard time choosing. Because there's so many awesome ones to choose? Well, not only that, but almost everybody I wrote about in the last book fit the definition yes. one way or another. Um, and for a while there, I was tempted to tell the story of Alexander the Great's older half-sister, who was also a general, because, I mean, Alexander the Great's right. older half-sister, also a general. How That's you resist? fascinating. But I ended up deciding instead to talk about a group of women who were known as the Women's Battalion of Death. Yes. They fought in World War I. Oh my gosh. Um, yes. you know, World War I is this really interesting turning point for women in modern looking militaries. Mm -hmm. Because during that war, the nations on both sides had desperate manpower shortages. And so they began to use women in ways that they had never allowed them to participate before. Mm -hmm. In the United States, in Great Britain, that meant that women took on non-combatant roles that freed up a man to fight. You know, they, they worked as clerical workers at first, and then they became radio operators and telegraph operators and designed camouflage and other cool stuff. But in Russia, women actually fought. Nice. Um, and between the um, February and the October revolutions, in 1919, the Russian government formed 15 all-female battalions. Really? And the yes. most important of those, the first of those, was the Women's Battalion of Death. Ooh. And that was led by a woman named Maria Bochkarova. And Bochkarova is fascinating. She was a semi-literate peasant woman. And when the war started, she decided it was a great way to get out of an abusive marriage. Ooh, yes. So she left Siberia, where she'd followed her husband into exile, and went back to her home region of Tomsk and tried to enlist in the 25th Tomsk Reserve Battalion. Alexander <gasps> said, women, not allowed. It's illegal for women to enlist in the Royal, the Imperial Russian military. Now, she just traveled all the way from Siberia to do this, um, so she pushed back. And finally, he just got snotty with her and said, why don't you just write to the czar and see if he says yes? Oh. And that's what she did. Now, she managed to talk him into helping her write the telegram to the czar. I'm sure he did it because he wanted to be done with it. <laughs> but to everyone's amazement, the czar said, yes, we'll do another oh, thumbs up here. Yes! A thumbs up month. <laughs> um, so with the czar's permission, she enlisted as a woman, not in disguise, you know, women have often enlisted disguised as men. That's not this. So she enlisted in the fourth company of the 25th Reserve Battalion. Her unit was sent to the Western Front in February of 1919, where the fighting was bad. Mm -hmm. And for two years, she served as a soldier in an otherwise all-male unit on the Western Front, and she put up with a lot of crap from her fellow soldiers. So. Um, when oh, she man. first got there, there many of them assumed that she was a prostitute who had been sent there for her conveni their convenience. So in addition to fighting the Germans, she was also fighting off her fellow soldiers. Um, that's cool. Something that's not <laughs> entirely unknown still today. Right. Nonetheless, despite all the crap, she served with distinction. She was wounded three times. Oh. The third time, a uh, shell fragment pierced her spine, leaving her paralyzed for a while. Oh, no. She learned to walk again, 
and went right back to the front. Really? Um, she received multiple military honors, including the St. George Cross, which yeah. was Imperial Russia's highest military honor for valor. Um, it's basically the equivalent of the Medal of Honor. And then in 1917, everything changed. February Revolution, mm -hmm. new government in place. And the provisional government, which is what we, the name we used for that government, declared that all subjects of the empire were free and equal citizens uh -huh. with the rights and duties that went with citizenship. Now, Russia already had a body of women that were interested in fighting to defend their country. Moshkarova mm -hmm. um, wasn't the only one. She was just the most visible. Um, other women did manage to tuck their way into units or disguise themselves as men to enlist. Mm -hmm. But there were other women who wanted to fight and couldn't. And a lot of them assumed that their new status as free and equal citizens included the right and the duty to bear arms in their country's defense. Yes. And shortly after the revolution, they um, took that concept of enlisting one step further. And women's groups started to petition the government to form all female military units. Cool. Now, at this point, women are eager to get into the army and men are, who are in the army are really eager for the war to stop. Because mm -hmm. even though World War I was a horrible war for everyone, Russia was having a really bad war because leadership was totally incompetent. So and the weather was horrible. I mean, when is horrible. the weather not horrible? You know, they were kind of used to the weather being horrible. I know. Wasn't it exceptionally <laughs> bad though? There was like terrible blizzards that came in during World War One. It, it was yeah, yeah, it was awful. And Every front. Was in bad. addition to weather, they were short on food. They were short on equipment. Um, the cat number of casualties was huge. Um, morale was low. Desertion rates were high, mm -hmm. you know, whole units mutinied. And a lot of people thought that women's battalions would be a solution to this. Um, the idea was that if you had women in the trenches, it would improve the morale of male soldiers, mm -hmm. or at the very least, it would shame them into fighting because, you know, uh, the girls are fighting. If the girls are fighting, surely you can. I'm um, so, so glad we can you know, get men to do the right thing by shaming them. <laughs> it's just a great leadership strategy. So in 1919, late May, the Minister of War approved the creation of a single all-female battalion, and he asked Bocharova to lead it. Yes. Um, she originally recruited about 2,000 women. By the time they were ready to head out, it would have down to about 300. Um, her leadership was a little questionable also. Um, but with less than a month of training, late June, those 300 women were sent into the field. Nice. And in fact, they were deliberately sent into an area that was suffering from massive desertions because, you know, women were going to get the guys to buck up. Right. The women got their first taste of battle on July 9th. Um, the Germans attacked and the order came down to the regiment that the women were attached to that they should advance against the enemy mm -hmm. and nothing happened. Oh. One of the other changes that the Russians made at this time was they formed what they called soldiers committees with the idea that the tr troops would sort of lead, would at least partially lead themselves that just begin to have a democratically run army. Um, I will say that worked about the way you would expect it to. This is not like a scout-led Boy Scout troop. This is a very different issue. Feel like it. Um, and so as soon as the order came to attack, the men in the regiment called the Soldiers Committee meeting to decide whether or not they were going to fight. Mm -hmm. And after several hours of a lot of conversation and no action, the women got impatient and decided mm -hmm. that they were going to advance whether the men did or not. Yes. Um, and I've got to be said that evidently there was some truth to the um, shaping men into action part because <laughs> when they left, several hundred men did accompany them. There you um, go. The Women's Battalion of Death successfully took two lines of German trenches with very few casualties, and then they held their position against six German counterattacks. 
Um, finally, they ran out of ammunition and they had to retreat. But before they retreated, they had captured two German machine gun nests and a number of German soldiers, including two officers who were really unhappy to have to surrender to them. <laughs> That is badassery. Yeah. Yes. Badassery down <laughs> yeah. the line. And because of that, other women wanted to be badasses too. Yes. Um, because of the success in the field of the Women's Battalion of Death, that inspired the creation of more of these units throughout Sweet. Russia. About 6,000 women volunteered. Nice. The provisional government formed another 15 official units. Beyond that, some grassroots women's organization formed at least 10 more units that were local. Wow. And a number of them did go into battle. Mm -hmm. The experiment didn't last very long because no. in October there was another revolution. Oh, the yeah. Bolsheviks seized power from the provisional government. They signed a separate peace treaty with Germany, which actually was probably good leadership, even though it was the Bolsheviks. Right. They immediately began to demobilize the armies. The women's units were among the first to go. Right. And the women who were demobilized didn't get treated very well. Oh, um, no. <laughs> when, you know, the, those battalions were associated in the public mind and in the Bolsheviks' mind specifically with the provisional government. And a lot of the women were charged as counter-revolutionaries. And when they went home, they were really easy to identify. I mean, they could change out of their uniforms, just like the male soldiers, but they'd shaved their heads to go into battle, uh, which meant they didn't blend very right. well. Their hair so was a lot as of long them, as everybody else. Plus also the bullet holes and the shrapnel. And <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, they... um. So they got treated badly by the people in their own hometowns. And the assumption that they were counter-revolutionaries wasn't entirely unfounded. Um, right. One group of them actually died defending the provisional government in the last days of the rebellion. So they went down for their beliefs. Yeah. A number of them later joined the White Army so that they are fighting against the Red Army in the Russian Civil War after the revolution. And as for Bochkarova, she fled to the United States, where oh. she managed to see President Wilson and to plea with him for Russia to inter for the United States to intervene. Oh. In then in 1919, she went back to Siberia mm -hmm. and she formed a paramedic group, a women's paramedic unit attached to the White Army. The Bolsheviks captured her, Christmas 1919. They tried her as an enemy of the state. This is beginning to sound a lot like Bonnie's story. I'm no. sorry. Oh, no. um, I'm and she was no. executed by a firing squad on May 16th, 1920. She was 30. Oh, Bonnie, oh, your lady was 31. And then mm -hmm. how many days between capture and assassination two. was Mar was two? What Pamela, yours, Maria? It was? Mine was like five months. Oh, okay, five months. Not quite five months. Still, there's so much correlation there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Holy cow. You know, a lot of these women don't have happy endings. I know. I know, right? It's I just, know. <laughs> we don't, you know, if, re if rebellions don't, win right rebels have a rough time correct and sometimes yeah. when they win and sometimes yeah. when they win rebels have a rough <laughs> yes, time exactly. and if they're female they have a rougher time because yeah all the usual reasons exactly and a couple extra sprinkled it on top <laughs> precisely <laughs> oh my goodness great but she did all of that before th she was in the war for two years she was in the war for two years before she formed the Oh, the paramedical. So she, she was in the war from 15 to the revolution. And then with the revolution, she, she ended up gotcha. forming the battalion. That battalion was around for about two months. Gotcha. So you figure she, yeah, almost three years. Gotcha. There you go. It's still being in, in war minded, in war zone, in danger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was ironic because Bonnie did cover Edith Wilson in a previous podcast when we did First Ladies mm -hmm. and how uh, Edith Wilson was kind of, you know, 
running a show a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and then when you mentioned her meeting with President Wilson, I think there is a drunk history episode where your lady oh. makes an appearance. Oh. I remember there being like a Russian lady war hero coming mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. talk to the troops and being like, I'm a lady and I'm doing this. That would be her. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's fascinating because Soviets basically squashed this story. They really, I mean, it was trumpeted under the provisional government. Right, of it was course. All over the media here. Right. Um, there was even a woman who was embedded with the women's battalion of death before they went into the field. So there are a bunch of interviews with the women about why they oh, joined. Nice. Yeah. Um, but then once the Soviets are in control. They don't want that story told. Right. Oh my gosh. And they just quash, quash, quash. By the way, hello, jellyfish. How are you? <laughs> jellyfish is Katie's cat. <laughs> yeah, <it's pretty. laughs> she loves being on the podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frequent guest right here. <laughs> she was our producer last year. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is fascinating though. Uh, I've heard so many stories about um, the uh, about the Bolsheviks and about the, the different revolutions that were all kind of like back to back to back. I never heard about uh, the Women's Battalion of Death. That is just, yeah, mind blowing. I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> we're going to shine a I'm, spotlight on it. <laughs> I'm glad I had a chance. Yeah. Is is it also in one of your books too? Yes. See, because I'm all about the shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely in Women Warriors, and yes. in a broader context of. Yeah, exactly. Oh yes. Oh, too fun. <laughs> Katie, Bonnie, did you have any questions? That was amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same. Absolutely. <laughs> I just don't see myself as a lady that would be running to the front lines of war. <laughs> I, right kind of makes me a little ashamed i'm not sure i have a warrior soul but the thing is we're not it's not for everybody you know not what i mean it's like we don't we don't have to be good at all things <laughs> um <laughs> but you know people always asked me when i wrote the civil war nurses book if number one i always got asked are you a nurse <laughs> it's like ah oh, uh, gotcha right but um i couldn't have done that right I exactly not have done that um and i I've kicked plenty of shins in my life, but I'm not sure I could go to war either. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we can champion and spotlight women who can. <laughs> because yeah. we need more of them. Because <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, hey, no. <laughs> yeah, I had never thought about women who were on the front line and revealing themselves, but not in that way. <laughs> that they would be fending off they're yeah. fellow men too mm -hmm. like that's just mm. yeah i have to get a time machine and kick some butts i know right because <laughs> i mean here you are in a war zone trying to survive but at the same time like you can't what you can't go to sleep you know what i mean like you can't mm -hmm. ever rest your mind because you're an enemy from both sides of it yeah. Um, and you're supposed to be fighting the same enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. But no, the patriarchy gets in the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got to smash that first, apparently. Yep. <laughs> Go back in that time machine. <laughs> that wraps us up. Um, join us next week with our next gal pal sharing her one cool rebel gal at the Gal's Guide podcast. Thanks for listening. Yay! For show notes, links, and images from this week's show, visit galsguide.org. Want exclusive stuff like deleted bits and major bloopers? Become a Gals Guide patron today. Thanks for listening. <laughs>